My presentation is a not quite surface scratching overview of the Python programming language. We'll talk about what Python is, how to install Python, running the Python interpreter, and understanding functions and classes in Python. We'll also look at a simple text game written in Python and go on a whistle-stop tour of the Django web application framework. Finally, we'll wrap up with some words about how I got started learning Python. There are many good reasons to consider learning Python. Its design emphasizes code readability. Not only is the syntax straightforward, but you can also express an idea in fewer lines of code to begin with. It's also very easy to do cross-platform work in Python. It is even more broadly supported than Java. It can be made to go virtually anywhere there's a C compiler. Here is a vaguely Pythonic method. I am most likely flying in the face of all good style, but perhaps we can glean some useful information out of this. First, notice that we start off a logical block with a colon, and then everything inside that block is indented. Also notice that this method, of some unknown class, takes itself as an argument. In Python 2, you have to do this. And if I don't reference myself when I'm calling my own methods, Python goes looking for globals. Maybe my computer is a global. Maybe it was 3 a.m. when I wrote this. Python is an interpreted language. There is platform-specific implementation going on behind the scenes. The usual implementation is CPython. For masochists, there is Jython and IronPython for Java and .NET respectively. And there is also a Python interpreter written in Python itself, PyPy. This just means it uses a layer of a restricted subset of Python to write the machine code. It still needs a C or other backend to work. When writing Python, the most important thing to keep in mind is that white space is significant. Indentation is used for logical blocks. In my experience so far, it makes Python a lot quicker to write, and I've adapted to the style to the point where I sometimes find myself omitting braces for single-line if statements in C++. That's bad, don't do that. The indentation must be consistent with itself within a logical block. You can use one-to-many spaces, or you can use tabs, but don't mix spaces and tabs, because the interpreter is not going to say, hmm, a tab, that's the same as four spaces, right? It's a good idea to set your text editor to just insert four spaces when you press tab. Civilized editors provide a facility for this. Python 2 and 3 are not compatible. You can't plunk your Python 2 files into the Python 3 interpreter and expect them to work. There are some platforms that don't yet support Python 3, and may never. Django, a popular web application framework, is only just now gaining support for Python 3. I focused on learning Python 2, as this was the Python presented in the Learn Python the Hard Way tutorials I completed. Civilized operating systems distribute Python themselves and often include it by default, but there's a major system out there called Windows that does not. If you haven't heard of it, it's a popular CPM clone that lacks package management. Windows users need to pay a visit to python.org slash download. Binaries for 32 and 64-bit windows are available. If you wish to run the programs in this package, download Python 2. Setting up the path variable to include the Python and scripts directories is highly advisable. This way, you can run Python scriptname.py from your scripts directories wherever you have them. In Windows 8, before following these steps, you will need to escape to an explorer window by facing Redmond Washington and chanting Bill is good. So if you have an explorer window, right click on your computer in the left sidebar and go to its properties. Click on advanced system settings. Under the advanced tab, click the environment variables button. Find the path variable in the system variables list box, select it, and press the edit button. Add your Python and Python scripts directories to the path. Click carefully into the variable value box, press the end key on your keyboard, 
and then you will be able to add these items at the end of your existing path. Type a semicolon and follow it with the Python folder's absolute path. Type another semicolon and follow it with the script subfolder's absolute path. For a default installation of Python 2.7.x, your paths will be the ones shown here. Playing with the interpreter. If you have Python installed and have the path environment variable, or the equivalent on your platform, set appropriately, entering Python at any command prompt should bring up the Python interpreter. Here you can enter Python instructions and see the results. You can also interact with APIs this way. The Django tutorials have learners set up instances of polls and poll choices through the Python console. Let's start with Hello World. In Python 3, you would do it like this. That is the extent of Python 3 that we will cover. For some insights into the philosophy of Python, try import this. And here we are at a command prompt in OpenSUSE, the Linux with a million pronunciations. Just type Python to start the interpreter. And now let's try Hello World. And you can also get that the philosophy bit I was mentioning earlier. When you're finished with the interpreter, you can input Control Z to get out of it. Let's try some printing. Put these lines into a text file called testprint.py. Pause the video here if you're following along. To see our results, we'll just enter Python and then the name of the file we made. And there we go. Notice that the print command neatly outputs a line of text. You don't need to indicate that you want a new line. Instead, you have to indicate when you don't want one. One way is to add a comma at the end of the statement. And you'll still get a new space between the strings, so you'd have to go out of your way to override that, too. But most of the time, you get what you want with a minimum of fuss. Another nice thing is that you can use either single or double quotes to define a string, and within the string, you can use the other one as punctuation without having to escape it. When you do need to escape something, use a backslash. Format strings are a breeze. Percent %s means to print an argument in its string representation. Percent %d means to print as an integer. Percent %s will usually do, but with percent number %d, you can specify how many spaces you want taken up. We'll try that in a moment. On the right side of your definition, you must provide as many comma-separated arguments as you have percent placeholders. Finally, if you want to print the percent sign itself, use percent percent. But if you didn't put the percent after the string to take arguments, you can just type percent or percent %s if you want to actually see percent %s, because they have no effect until the percent sign and arguments are set up to the right of the string. Let's go back into the interpreter and play with lists. Lists are easy to create in Python and have many useful features. Here's a quick way to get a list of numbers. We can iterate through this list. And here we're going to do the n digit thing with percent %d we mentioned earlier. So we'll have a space for two digits and then a space for three digits. And we're looking at the element in the list and its square, the element times itself. Let's make a new list. By the way, I'm taking these examples from the Python introduction at arachnoid.com. Accessing sublists is very easy. In these examples, the first value is the index of the desired first element. The second value is the index for the last desired element, plus one. Now that had nothing. I like to think of it as the point zero kind of point where you come to a screeching halt and you don't pick up the thing in front of you. So going from 2.0 to 2.0 you got nothing, but going from 2.0 to 3.0 you got bird. 
and then going from 0 to 4.0 you get the whole darn thing. You can also leave off an argument to say you want everything in that direction. And you can also use negative 1 to mean the end of the list. Though when you use it as the second argument, it will mean stopping short of picking up that last item, just like always. Let's look at functions in Python. Type out the code you see here, and save it as function.py. You might want to pause the video here, if you're following along. Okay, let's run it. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit. Indentation. It must be consistent within a logical block. Here I am using four spaces. You could use more, you could use fewer, but don't mix spaces and tabs. You can split your statements over multiple lines if you use a backslash. The white space in front of the percent name parts therefore doesn't matter, but I lined it up so it would look nice. Len object returns the length of an object. In this case, it corresponds to the number of characters in a string. If statements. They go if, elif, not else if, and else. And you must place a colon before your inner statements, even if you're only going to write one and keep it on the same line. And finally, as it is in C++, things are loaded from top to bottom, so if you call happy birthday above the definition for happy birthday, it won't end well. Classes in Python are a little bit funky, but you can definitely get used to typing out an entire class in four or five lines. Type out the code you see here as class.py and save it. You might want to pause the video now. Okay, let's run it. Now let's go back and look at the code. Base classes in Python 2 have to explicitly inherit from object. It shows how classes are a little bit of an afterthought in Python. The equivalent of a constructor is the underscore underscore init underscore underscore function. If you supply one, it is called automatically when an object is instantiated. Inheritance. To inherit from another class, or multiple classes, Supply the class names as arguments for the class. For example, on line 10, cat inherits from animal. Assignment to self, the equivalent of this, has to be done explicitly. If you don't specify self, Python thinks you mean a global variable. Finally, methods of a class must take self as the first argument. In a sense, mycat.talk is really syntactic sugar for talk my cat. One day, somewhere deep in the halls of an institution much like this one, someone went berserk and created this satirical Python game. I have examined it for research purposes and included the code in this package. To run the game, ensure that both the game.py and scenes.py files are available in the same folder, then enter Python game.py at the command prompt while in that folder. The design appears to be based on a similar game by Z.A. Shaw called Gothons from Planet Purcell 25, explored in his Learn Python the Hard Way tutorials. You may want to examine the code in the game.py and scenes.py files. The engine is defined in game.py. The game loops inside the engine, until someone presses Ctrl Z. The engine is responsible for printing a dividing line and then calling up another scene. The engine takes a map of scenes, and the map and all scenes are defined in the scenes.py module. A module is a convenient way to organize related classes. The map's job is to relate particular classes to keywords. Every scene is its own class, each with its own .enter method, 
whose primary job is to return the keyword for the appropriate following scene, depending on what you did. The scene structure you see in MAP is an associative array of key value pairs. These are called dictionaries in Python. Note that the braces are used instead of square brackets that are used for plain lists. The ellipsis is there only to cut down the list of scenes to make the code easier to read. The particular scenes all inherit from scene, in which the code for commonplace things is defined, checking for a monster, what happens when you meet it, advancing to the next turn, etc. If a user inputs an action the scene isn't set up for, it returns its own keyword to the engine. The keyword for student services is lowercase student services, hence the use of the lower function on the class's name, and the engine simply serves the same scene again. There are several interesting tricks in the game, like random dialogue and random encounters. To learn more, check out the complete code, perhaps after playing the game a few times. Reading all the code first would spoil the surprises. I'm going to try to put it up on one of those sites that let you run a Python console in JavaScript. I'll be linking it in the video description. Django is a popular Python web application framework. Primarily for my concurrent Rich Internet Applications course, I installed Django and followed its tutorials to make a simple web poll. Django has many useful features and makes it possible to write powerful yet concise web applications, possibly without having to write a single line of SQL. Django can also leverage the SQL-like database facilities built into Python. It even has a built-in administration tool that you could customize into a back-end site, and you get model view controller architecture right out of the box. It's free, and best of all, it's not PHP. Notable users of Django include PBS, Pinterest, and, for the terminally self-obsessed, Instagram. It comes with a handy built-in administration tool where you can manage your users and your data objects, like polls and poll choices. A short winded redo of the tutorials is out of reach here. But once you have Django running, the rest is straightforward, provided your attention to detail is excruciating and you've had about 15 hours of sleep. Let's look at the models, controller, and a view used in the sample polls application. Models. Python's expressive form makes banging out entity models a breeze. You can also use the Django API to commit instances of these classes to the database. You really don't have to write a single line of SQL. Views.py is the controller. It has a bit of logic, but it mostly just says what page to bring up. There are some return HTTP response lines commented out. You could bang out entire pages here, but you definitely wouldn't want to. URLs.py Django has pretty URLs almost baked in, and what action your controller fires is as simple as knowing a little rejects. Who doesn't? and pointing the right URL pattern to the right controller. This part is a little clunky, but at least the pattern is easy to pick up, and you don't have to have a whole bunch of if trees in your controller itself. Finally, let's look at one of our HTML files. It's not simply Python in HTML, it's a separate Django template language. The percent braces are for tags, and the plain braces just print variables. They're purposely vague about what a tag is, but they do say that they do something. So let's try our poll. We should be able to go to it and see all one of the polls we've defined so far. We can vote on it and see the results. I'm not so much scratching the surface as I am sliding my finger along a shop window. If this interests you, You'll want to take a long time to dive into this on your own time. I know I already prefer this over PHP, but that isn't paying Python or Django much of a compliment. Learn Python! There are a plethora of resources available. Stack Overflow is a great place to find answers to Python questions, provided your signal-to-noise attenuators are running at full efficiency. For my part, I completed the first 45 exercises of Z.A. Shaw's Learn Python the Hard Way, 
available in HTML for free at learnpythonthehardway.org. I enjoy reading, but I really learn by doing, and so I did. The approach at Learn Python the Hard Way is to do something first, no copy and pasting, then break it apart until we understand it. Speaking from my own experience, I've had to learn object-oriented programming and many other complex concepts in a similar way. And this is where I'd ask for questions and comments. Thanks for watching.